recent videos, we revisited some cool British singles released during the second half of 1967. Now, it's November's turn. And November 1967 was definitely a great month for singles. In fact, so many great singles were released that month, that this video will probably have a second part. So, without further ado, here are some cool British singles, released in November 1967. November 1967 saw the release of Hello Goodbye by the Beatles, with I Am The Walrus as the B-side. Hello Goodbye was an excellent song with a signature McCartney melody, but I think many Beatles fans will agree that the highlight here was the B-side. I Am The Walrus was a truly remarkable achievement and one of the highlights of the Beatles' psychedelic period, with its surrealist lyrics and an excellent and very inventive arrangement. At the time, most reviewers also seemed to agree that the B-side was the highlight, Record Mirror wrote, The Beatles have a new E out, but the flip seems to be as strong or better than the official A side. Journalist Peter Jones wrote, First impressions, typical McCartney vocals on this deliberately repetitive medium pace item. It sounds like a send up, the lyrics mean nothing, but the insidious compelling brainstorming will take this to number one. The flip is far better. John takes lead on the fantastic wailing production. It's got interesting acid sounds throughout, and catchy strange lyrics. A very long side with the usual Beatles psychological tricks being played throughout. Safe as milk. The song generated some controversy in the national newspapers. Disc Magazine reported. A national newspaper has already attacked I Am The Walrus for its controversial lyric, saying that it may cause censorship headaches at the BBC and that some American stations might ban the song. Part of the lyric goes. John Lennon said, the words just appeared that way. You might just as well ask me to explain how any of our lyrics come to be written. Paul added, the whole point is that this is quite a commonplace saying, to be caught with your knickers down is to be taken by surprise or to be caught on the hop. It's quite harmless. I can't see anyone being shocked. Certainly, we weren't out to create deliberate double meanings here. Greet them warmly, please. The Pink Floyd. November 1967 also saw the release of Pink Floyd's third single, Apples and Oranges. By the time the single was released, Sid Barrett's mental health was already on a serious downward spiral. Later that month, Pink Floyd were part of a package tour with Jimi Hendrix, The Nice, and The Move. And guitarist David Olist from The Nice, had to substitute for Barrett on several occasions when he was unable to perform or failed to appear. Pink Floyd's previous two singles got excellent reviews in the press, and so did their debut album, which was released in August. But the press didn't seem to be as enthusiastic about apples and oranges. Melody Maker wrote, A new Sid Barrett composition for the Floyd is an easier but heavily electronic number, swinging in tingling whirring electricity. The Floyd's music is always vibrant energy-laden stuff, but this particular number is pretty difficult to get hold of. It's a good record with some exciting sounds, but I think it will go over a few people's heads. And it will certainly freak out Jimmy Young because he's too old. And it's the Jimmy Young Show! Journalist Penny Valentine, who used to review the new singles every week for Disc Magazine, was never a big fan of Pink Floyd and this single didn't seem to change her views on the band. The journalist wrote, I really find it hard to review records by the Pink Floyd, mainly because to be quite honest, I don't really understand what they're trying to do musically, which is my own fault I'll admit. And the other reason, is that ever since their manager phoned up to say in a rather pompous way that he and the group hardly considered my reviews worth the paper they were written on, I have never felt exactly drawn with tremendous warmth towards them. Be that as it may, they have a lot of fans and seem to have worked very hard on this record. There's a few nice things going, and since nobody else will understand what it's about either, it will probably be a hit. I like the end. The single stalled at number 55. Nights in white satin, never reaching the end. When Nights in White Satin was released in November 1967, nobody would have expected the song to become the huge classic it eventually became. The Moody Blues hadn't had a hit since early 1965, when Denny Lane was still their frontman and leader. 
Throughout most of 1966, their bookings devolved to workingmen's clubs and cabaret. At that point, Denny Lane left the band and was replaced by Justin Hayward. John Locke also joined the band as their bass player. When Nights in White Satin was originally released in November 1967, Penny Valentine was the only journalist who recognized the quality of the song and wrote a full review about it. Penny Valentine wrote, For a long time the Moody's have been searching for a hit, and it would be nice to have them back in the charts. This is a lovely record and a personal favorite of mine, but I don't think it has instant appeal even though people will like to listen to it. There's a gentle desperate air of holding on to something that's slipping away. And it's got a beautiful cool arrangement. Nice. The single wasn't an instant success. Even though it was released in November 11th, it didn't reach the British charts until February 1968. And it stalled at number 19. In the States, it only managed to reach number 103. The single, however, was reissued in 1972, reaching number 2 on the Billboard charts and number 1 on the Cashbox Top 100. In Britain, it reached its highest position at number 9 that year. And the single was reissued yet again in 1979, becoming a top 10 hit in the UK and Ireland. Another band which faced a similar challenge as the Moody Blues was The Pretty Things. In 1967, most people remembered The Pretty Things as one of the bands from the so-called British rhythm and blues boom of 1964. And most journalists seemed to be quite skeptical about their change of musical direction. Defecting Grey, however, is one of the great British singles of 1967. The song had a very unusual structure. It starts out as a weird trippy waltz which eventually gives way to a truly aggressive part that predated the sound of punk rock by at least 10 years. Chris Welch reviewed the single for The Melody Maker, and his review reflected the skepticism of the press towards the band's change of direction. The journalist wrote, Good old pretty things. Right in the middle of the sitar, backward guitar, electronics, you can hear a rocking group bashing away. You have to put up with a bit in 3-4 time, and some coy singing. And then comes the blast. It's a pity that groups ever discovered that word, progress. Record Mirror wrote, Change of sound and style for the group. Not to mention a change of label. To be fair I'm not entirely sold on this and it could miss out. I draw your attention to the mood switching and the sheer power later on. It could either flop out, or click big. The single failed to chart, and so did their psychedelic cult classic SF Sorrow, released a year later. The album was one of the first rock operas and it was a major influence on many albums that came later. But it wasn't until the mid to late 70s that the Pretty Things psychedelic period was rediscovered, and given the respect it deserved. One of the great debut singles of November was this one by The Nice. The group, led by keyboardist Keith Emerson, was originally formed in early 1967 as a backing group for soul singer P.P. Arnold. The Nice eventually set out on their own and quickly developed a strong live following. Their blend of rock classical music and jazz became a major influence on many bands from that era. And they were constantly featured in the press during the late 60s. The Melody Maker wrote, of all the new groups to emerge this year, the nice are the most musically rewarding, as well as being exciting and original. The Cream were the group event of 1966, and the nice are this year's equivalent, if not in terms of publicity and instant recognition, but at least in achievement. But the wheels are turning in the right direction, and Chief Wheel Andrew Oldham, the man who brought the Stones to fame, has signed them to his immediate record company and he is predicting a big future for them. Their album, only recently cut and as yet untitled, includes some of the most exciting music I have ever heard produced by a British group. The single failed to chart, but later in 1968, the song became the theme tune of the British television series The Tyrant King. This single is one of the most sought-after British psychedelic singles of 1967. 
In recent years, copies have changed hands on Discogs or eBay for over £1,000. The top side, which was actually called B-side, was an excellent Mellotron-dipped psychedelic song. But the B-side, called Vacuum Cleaner, was just as good or perhaps even better. Both songs have appeared on several compilations over the years, which helped increase their cult status. The single got quite positive reviews in the press. Record Mirror wrote, One of the most promising outfits in a long time. Could be a first-time hit. It certainly is a value for money coupling. The New Musical Express wrote, A case of the A-side being the B-side, if you see what I mean. A great sound on this disc which has a strangely ethereal quality. It makes you listen attentively throughout. Another good one from Derham. The single failed to chart, and it was the first and last single by the band. Another single released that month that went pretty much unnoticed was this one by the Zombies. The New Musical Express wrote, In this song, we have to imagine that the singer's girlfriend is in prison and he's writing her a letter explaining what wonderful times they will have together when she gets out. Despite the depressing nature of the subject and its questionable taste, it's extremely well treated. Sincerely rendered by its composer Rod Argent, enhanced by colorful Beach Boy type harmonies, with a mid-tempo beat, clavier line and delicious string scoring. The flip is a plaintive tale of lost love, wistfully and delicately sung and then exploding into a big bash in the chorus. Again, a delightful harmonic blend. Once again, the single failed to chart. Flames by Elma Gantry's Velvet Opera is the sort of song that should have been a massive hit in November 1967. But despite getting a lot of airplay on John Peel's Top Gear radio show, the song only managed to reach number 30 in the charts. The track would eventually be included on the band's debut album, a very underrated record that's definitely well worth checking out. As a curious note, Flames was part of Led Zeppelin's early live repertoire. In an interview with Trouser Press from 1977, Jimmy Page said, We toured Scandinavia before recording the first album, and we had a few things we were doing at the time which never got recorded. Flames, written by Elmer Gantry, was a really good number. Robert Plant later revived the song with his late 90s side project Priory of Brian. At the time, the only newspaper which bothered to review the single was the New Musical Express. The New Musical Express wrote, A subtle blend of blues soul and pop make this British group a very commercial proposition. It's a fiery dynamic sound with a driving beat. Perfect for discotheques. The band recorded a second album in 1969 which was also a commercial failure. Three members of the group would later become members of the Strokes, Hudson Ford and Streck. Another excellent single released that month that went pretty much unnoticed was this one by The Tickle. The single was produced by future T-Rex and David Bowie producer Tony Visconti. Visconti must have liked what he heard because a couple of years later, the group worked as David Bowie's backing band on his second album, the one that features the song Space Oddity. The song got mixed reviews in the press. The melody maker wrote, Good and brash group sounds. All whining and droning and sort of erupting. An atmosphere builder that somehow drops short. Sadly, the single failed to chart. And just like many other bands from that era, this became the band's first and last single. Is yet another single from 1967 that has appeared on several site compilations over the years. The single was a commercial failure when it was originally released, but it has become a cult favorite among fans of British psychedelia. The fact that the band appeared on the press dressed as monks probably didn't help increase sales numbers. Gimmicks were alright as long as your single was a very obvious novelty song. 
but Meditations just sounded too weird and psychedelic to be considered a novelty single. Record Mirror reported, Felius Andromeda recorded their Meditations debut single in a North London church. The arrangement of this excellent number called for a proper church organ. For the moment, most of the boys are staying out of sight, as you can see from the picture. The boys said, the fate of our record was decided at a seance soon after we recorded the number. The message from a spirit signing himself the devil, read, Felius Andromeda, hit. And the boys add, since working on this record in the church, we've been surrounded by a strange atmosphere which has affected the group deeply. All very strange, weird, and moody. For the way things work out, keep an eye on the charts. Once I build a tower to the sun, and and the massive success of the movie Bonnie and Clyde prompted many Carnaby street shops to start selling clothes inspired by 1930s fashion. This was the beginning of a fad that lasted for about two months. And many bands and artists tried to jump on the bandwagon by adopting a 1930s gangster look. This strategy worked for Georgie Fame, who scored a decent hit in December 1967 with a song called Bonnie and Clyde. But it didn't seem to work for St. Valentine's Day Massacre. St. Valentine's Day Massacre were actually the Artwits. The Artwits featured future Deep Purple member John Lord on organ and Ronnie Wood's older brother, Art Wood, on lead vocals. Despite being very popular on the club scene, all the singles by the Artwits had failed to chart. And their first full-length album, released in 1966, wasn't a huge success either. By late 1967, the demand for rhythm and blues groups was dwindling, and as a last desperate attempt to keep the band alive, they agreed to change their name and adopt a 1930s gangster look. The song they released, Brother Can You Spare a Dime, was an excellent and very unusual cover of the 1930s Bing Crosby classic. Disc Magazine interviewed the band and asked them about their change of name and image. Art Wood said, It was Phillips recording manager Jack Bavistock's idea. He had it on strong authority that Bonnie and Clyde was going to have such a strong effect on fashion, that the gangster image would be a successor to Flower Power. Despite getting good reviews in the press, the single failed to chart in Britain. However, it was a big hit in Scandinavia, and this unexpected success allowed the band to make some money by touring Scandinavia for the remainder of the year. In an interview several years later, John Lord said, I felt bloody ridiculous, it wasn't too bad abroad, but back in England we had to wear these suits and I felt stupid playing dressed like that, we all did. Despite their success in Scandinavia and various promotional appearances with actress Faye Dunaway, who played Bonnie in the film, the group disbanded. Lead singer Art Wood recalled, It was a sad way to go, but when all is said and done, it was a good single. It had a great atmosphere and I still really like it. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to November 1967. Stay tuned for the second part of this video. See you next time.